The race to secure qualification for the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar is well underway across the world. And in Africa, the competition is cutthroat with minnows upstaging giants of African football. The second round matches are currently underway and the action will continue for the next three days, by which time the contenders to the elusive tickets will have staked their claim while pretenders to the tournament will be left seeking for answers. Sports Scene zeroes in on the ongoing African qualifiers for the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar. Hello and welcome to your weekly sports program that brings you all the sporting news and reviews from an African perspective. We will highlight the thrill of victory while also showing you the agony of defeat. I'm Richard Ntai in Nairobi. This is Sports Scene. Put on your seatbelts, buckle up, get ready, get ready. Let's get started. Here's what's coming up in the show. South Africa head coach welcomes the return of football fans to the stadium. Finding football stars from victims of war, the story of Syrian refugees in Egypt. Welcome in. Just like that, sports scene is on the air. We will get to those other stories in just a moment. But first, we start with a tantalizing serving of football, which is on the menu. Yes, indeed. Two crucial African 2022 foot FIFA World Cup qualifying matches are due to begin just minutes from now. And Senegal's Lions of Turinga will host Namibia, while Morocco will play Guinea-Bissau. Morocco will aim to continue their impressive recent winning streak when they take on Guinea-Bissau in their 2022 FIFA World Cup Group I qualifier in Casablanca on Saturday. A second victory in just three days over Guinea-Bissau would move Morocco five points clear of Saturday's opponents who have already played one game more in this group stage at the top. Now, Bahid Holly Hostage's side have won their last five matches across all competitions and have made a strong start in Group I following a resounding 2-0 and 5-0 victory over Sudan and Guinea-Bissau in September and October. Moroccan coach has urged his players to be calm as they face Guinea-Bissau again. Regarding Saturday's match against Guinea-Bissau, everyone says that we cannot lose this match. But anything is possible. We can lose it for any reason. Everything is psychological in this match. So we have to calm down. We could be a little bit too relaxed and that could cost us dearly. So a qualifying match for the World Cup must always be approached as a very important match. Guinea-Bissau will aim to avenge their heavy defeat to Morocco when the two sides meet for the second time in just three days. Bachiro Kande's side had drawn one all with Guinea and beaten Sudan 4-2 in their opening two group games, but then suffered a heavy 5-0 loss to Morocco, which leaves their qualification hopes for Qatar 2022 in the balance. Now, before their first encounter, Guinea-Bissau had attempted to get the game postponed after six of their players were taken to hospital on the eve of the match with food poisoning. Another defeat for Guinea-Bissau, who have already played one game more in the group stage against Morocco, would move Saturday's opponents five points clear of Conde's men. We know that football brings big challenges. At the moment, we are in a recovery stage. I believe on Saturday we will do everything possible, regardless of a 5-0 defeat to Morocco in the first match. In this second meeting, we will try to change some things. A few players have recovered from injury, but not everyone is 100% fit. And with a new coach, there was so much to look forward to in Egypt's tie against Libya in the 2022 FIFA World Cup qualification Group F match at the Borj El Arab Stadium on Friday night. The Pharaohs left it late to claim a 1-0 victory, much to the relief of the nation. Egypt won its first match under new coach Carlos Kerosh on Friday. The Pharaohs took the three points from visitors and regional rivals Libya. Now they lead Group F of the second round of the CAF 2022 World Cup qualifiers by just a point from their North African neighbors. This was a match about winning all three points. We were not expecting much more. The character of Carlos Kiras has not been absorbed yet by the players. It's clear that he prefers to play with a 4-3-3 formation. 
The differences in individual skills and team play between us and Libya was very evident. Our team is on its way to becoming much better. Karoj, the African-born Portuguese coach, may have not had the time to influence the Egyptian national team, but his selection clearly showed he thinks differently. He benched El Ahli stars, midfielder Afsha and striker Mohamed Sharif, who many see them among the best in Egypt. The coach then pulled a trick up from under his sleeve, Stuttgart's forward Omar Marmouche, a debutant to the Pharaohs who repaid his coach's faith by scoring the only goal in the game, a sensational shot from outside the box to the reverse top angle of the goal. Omar Marmouche, uh, Omar Marmouche was a great addition to the team. Many people were very surprised that he wasn't part of any national team before, not even the under-23 in the Tokyo Olympics. He's an international player in Germany. We thought he would be part of the Pharaohs. Poirot not only selected him as a main player in the formation, Omar had a strong presence and scored the only goal. The Pharaohs lead Group F with seven points from three matches. They opened the first qualification round with a home victory over Angola before a 1-1 draw away to Gabon. On Saturday, the Egyptian national team packed their bags and headed to Benghazi for their second leg game against Libya, scheduled for October 11. The pitch in Benghazi is made from artificial grass. Our players are not used to that. I think they'll have to get trained on similar pitches for the next few days, hopefully without affecting the players' health. That is the only challenge our team will face. Libya will be very excited to play at home, but without fans, I don't think it will have any effect. It won't be different from the match played here. It's a good start for Carlos Carroche with the Pharaohs. He did win his first match, but the team's performance was not so pleasing. Egypt dominated the ball throughout the match, yet failed to score more than a first-half goal. The Pharaohs appear to be still lacking harmony. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. All right, let's dig deep into the ongoing FIFA World Cup qualifiers with Deji Omotoyinbo, who is a sports analyst based in Lagos, Nigeria. Deji, welcome to Sports Scene. Let's dig straight into it. Just how big was Nigeria's loss to the CAR, and what do such results tell us about the current state of African football? Well, it was a huge result. Nigeria had not lost at home in 40 years in World Cup qualifying. That dates to 1981. That was the last time Nigeria lost to the Algerian team that eventually qualified for the 1982 Nations Cup. So losing to Algeria is one thing. Losing to Central African Republic is something altogether different. It was a shock to the system for the Nigerians. Nobody believed it. And it just underlines that in football, when you're complacent, which I think the Nigerian team was, they thought they just needed to turn up and win the game. When you're complacent, when you underrate your opponent, when you don't treat your opponent with the required level of respect, you are susceptible to a result like that. So um, for Central African Republic, fantastic result. Um, their coach said he had won the World Cup by beating Nigeria in Lagos. You, you have to understand how emotional and happy he was after that. But for Nigeria, the good thing was that um, Nigeria still stopped the group. And um, I expect that they will, will have top to bounce back in Yaoundé on Sunday with the result against Central African Republic. But it was a huge, huge shock to the system. All right, Deji, I think shock was an understatement. A lot of Nigerians are going to have to be medicated for depression after that Super Eagles loss. And that brings me to my next uh, question. Let's talk big picture here. Is it fair that Africa has to go through three qualifying rounds to decide its World Cup finalists? And does this process skew qualification in favor of some nations? Well, that's what CAF came up with, you know. Um, they wanted to reduce the number to 40 teams in 10 groups of four. And, um, you know, we have, I think we have about 52 teams in Africa, so there was a preliminary round to reduce the number to 40 who have been grouped into these 10 uh, groups that we have. Compared to South America, though, uh, South America played 18 games. Uh, they have to play home and away. The Europeans play also 10, 8 to 10 games. Whichever country qualifies from Africa will probably play 
six games, the top team will play six games in this round, and then the home and away, probably eight games as well. Um, so it's what the uh, CAF came up with. The teams have to go through it and try and uh, make the best of a difficult situation, you know. The fixtures have come thick and fast, but um, I honestly feel that under the circumstances, not much could be done because of the um, dates for international matches and World Cup qualifiers. Um, and I really don't think it's more difficult, uh, but I think, like you said, because of the seedings, the big teams will likely end up with the big teams the real <laughs> big names in African football might be the ones to qualify for that World Cup again. All right, Deji, we could go on and on, but we've got to leave it there. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. Well, let's talk about it some more. Nigeria's Super Eagles suffered a shock defeat in the hands of the wild beast of the Central African Republic in their 2022 World Cup qualifier on Thursday in Lagos. The Super Eagles were made to pay dearly for missed chances when the visitors scored the only game of the only goal of the game in stoppage time to claim a famous victory. CGTN's Deji Patamosi was there and now reports. Even though this was the very first time both sides would be meeting, no one gave the lowly visitors any chance to topple their illustrious host. And that's understandable. The Super Eagles are currently ranked 34th in the FIFA ranking and were facing the 124th placed Minos the Central African Republic. But any idea that this game was going to be a walkover for the star-studded Nigerians, parading players from the top leagues in the world, quickly faded after a goalless opening 20 minutes. The Central African Republic held firm against their illustrious host, soaking in everything thrown at them. Nigerian Napoli top striker Victor Simen had the best chances for the Super Eagles, but he wasted all of them. And just when everyone was settling for a goalless draw, lightning struck for the Super Eagles in the 91st minute. It was a huge shock, and the visitors celebrated like never before. Some Nigerian fans who could not stand it began leaving the stadium. The Super Eagles had been beating in their own backyard by a team no one had given a chance. Oh, I feel so happy because uh, I think in the story there's not a lot of teams coming in, here in Nigeria or in Lagos to beat the, the Super Eagles. That's why I'm very proud of the team. It's a young team. Most of all, they are playing the first or second cup. They are 20, 21 years old. That's why they, they give the hearts on the pitch. And I'm very proud because, yeah, they did uh, what we want. We want to come, to, to come back home with the points, with the points, the single point. But we have three. So it's, it's uh, I think, for the history of Central African football, it's the, the most and the most excited uh, achievement. The Super Eagles technical bench did not show up at the post-match press conference and refused to make any comments, but the fans had a lot to say. There's a bit of laxity in the team. Um, that urgency, that purposefulness is absent in the team. From the first half, you could see that they were playing sideways and coming back to the defence. And that was not really good. The transition was extremely poor. I thought they would improve in the second half, but it didn't happen. Nigeria still remains top of Group C with six points, two more than both Cape Verde and Central African Republic, with Liberia stuck in the bottom of the group. No one expected the outcome of this match was going to be the way it turned out. It's even doubtful that the Central African Republic team ever expected they were going to beat the Super Eagles in this stadium right here in Lagos. But then that's football for you. The Super Eagles fans are really bitter, and for them, nothing short of victory when the Super Eagles takes on the Central African Republic in that second leg in Cameroon on Sunday will be enough to assuage their feelings. Deji Badimosi, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. Unbelievable scenes in Lagos, Nigeria there. This is sports scene. Do not go away. We're just getting warmed up. Here's what's ahead. South African football team welcomes the return of their fans to the stadium.
Welcome back to Sports Scene. Thanks for sticking with us. Meanwhile, South Africa head coach Hugo Bruce is confident that returning fans will lift his side as they aim to take a step closer to qualifying for the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar. Vaccinated fans will be in attendance for their return qualifier against Ethiopia at the FNB Stadium next week for the first time since March 2020. CDTN CS Duplessis reports. The Belgian former AFCON winner was upbeat as he addressed the media here at the Dobsonville Stadium in Soweto ahead of the crucial FIFA World Cup Group G qualifiers against Ethiopia. Bruce stressed the importance of the next two matches and the fact that returning fans would give his charges a lift in what is very much a must-win encounter on South African soil. It's always, a, 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 how can I say it, a, a, something that gives you more as a team and certainly in bad moments. If then the crowd is there and they begin to shout and they begin to sing and they begin to support you, then you can do better things than you even thought that you could do. So it, it, the crowd is very important. Captain Ronwyn Williams was excited that fans would be returning to the stadium and hoped that his teammates would feel the energy from the supporters who have waited a very long time to watch their beloved Bafana in action. We've missed them. You know, the game hasn't felt the same. Honestly speaking, it felt like, like a friendly game, you know, because you can hear everyone screaming. And it's been tough, you know, but being a professional, you've got to do what you've got to do. And we know what's at stake. So them coming back, you know, obviously they've missed us as well. They've missed sport. So they're going to come back with that excitement. Hugo Bruce says he feels frustrated by the lack of cooperation from certain South African football clubs and the bizarre decision by a player not to honour his call-up. He acknowledges that dialogue is required to find a way to resolve the situation, but feels that it is something that will have to wait as his charges face a tricky trip away to Ethiopia before welcoming fans back to Soccer City for the first time in 18 months, where he is confident the table-topping Bafana Bafana can produce another winning display on home soil and take another step towards World Cup qualification. CS2 plus C, CGTN, Soweto, South Africa. Unbeaten Tunisia took a step closer to clinching an all-important ticket to the third and final round of the CAF qualifying for the 2022 FIFA World Cup by beating Mauritania 3-0 in Group B on Thursday at the Rod Stadium. Victory kept alive their charge towards qualifying for a sixth World Cup as CGTN's Adnan Shawal Shi reports. Elias Tsiri, Wahbi Al Khazri, and Saif Adin Jaziri scored the three goals for Tunisia with a third win in a row. The Kaltich Eagles consolidated their leadership of Group B with nine points ahead of Equatorial Guinea, who defeated Zambia earlier in Malabo. Mauritania closed the group with zero points. We've scored three points after the third victory in a row. We scored eight points while keeping clean sheets. Our players showed a good performance in the face of our respectful Mauritian adversaries. We've created several occasions and improved our game to win this match, but we need to improve efficiency in the 16-meter area. Next for Tunisia is their away leg fixture against Mauritania on Sunday. Head coach Mondarek Bayri is targeting another win to keep the momentum. The next match will be played abroad and outside of home. It will be very difficult because the pitch is made of artificial turf. We need to recover as soon as possible. The second match is a second fight. It will be a difficult challenge. The Tunisian squad needs to play as one. We'll play to win and to qualify. Despite losing any hope of qualifying for the next phase, Mauritania players declared that they are hopeful that their team will play better at home. We were prepared for the results. We knew that the match would be difficult and decisive. It was hard to score, win or secure a draw. Now that we've lost, we are out of the World Cup qualifier. We'll perform better and try to win at home. The Eagles of Carthage will play Mauritania again on Sunday in Wakshot before traveling to Equatorial Guinea then receiving Zambia in their last two Group B second round 2022. FIFA World Cup 2022 qualifiers. Adam Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Uganda edged East African neighbors Rwanda 1-0 in their 2022 FIFA World Cup qualifier on Thursday. The results reignited Ugandan Crane's hopes of making the third and final round of qualifiers from Group E. CGTN's Leon Sinyenge reports from Kampala. 
It's match day and Bruce Turiam won a prep swan evening at work. He will be commentating on the World Cup qualifying match between Rwanda and Uganda on the radio. Bruce, like other Ugandan soccer fans, is hoping they'll win, but isn't convinced. Both uh, these teams, their previous 25 games, we've seen 10 games ending in scoreless draws. So we might call them the, uh, the kings of scoreless draws. So even this particular game, I do expect a draw. This one, it looks to be a different team now that is going to play. So I, I'm, I'm looking at this game, Uganda winning, as the first game for them to win. There's a huge rivalry between Uganda and Rwanda that goes beyond sport. But both sides have struggled through the opening fixtures of their group. Neither have won a match. It's the Uganda Cranes that have the early advantage at half time, and that is the kind of result that the commentators here were expecting. But with another 45 minutes to play, it could be anyone's game for the taking. The second half offered more for the hosts, Rwanda but they couldn't turn their chances into goals. The single goal was enough to see Uganda claim three points and also a fast win in 10 games. We defended well after scoring, so I think it was a, a deserved win, and it's now leaving the group so wide and open. We are very happy for the three points, but I think we... We deserve more. The Uganda Cranes now climb to second in Group E with five points. The two sides meet again this Sunday. Leon Sanyange, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. Elsewhere, Kenya's chances of making the 2022 World Cup Finals took a huge hit following a devastating 5-0 defeat to Mali in their Group E clash at the neutral venue of Morocco on Thursday. The two teams meet again on Sunday in Nairobi, where the Harambe Stars need nothing short of a miracle to keep alive their slim hopes of clinching the only ticket to the third and final round of the CAF World Cup qualifiers. Head coach Ejin Farat, who saw the side capitulate on his debut at the helm, apologized to the Kenyans for the heavy defeat when the team made a low-key return to Nairobi. Mali led Group E on seven points and will remain top if they avoid defeat to the dispirited Kenyans on Sunday. The Stars, however, are hoping to turn the tables. After the match, like I was shocked, the boys were shocked. We made so many uh, simple mistakes. If you see all goals, I couldn't say really Mali scored, and it was like we made them. So we analyzed the goals, we finished this part, and now it is only to put everything together. This means, come on, boys, what happened, happened. Life goes on. We have now, this is our big luck. We don't have now 10 months or something. We have three days later against the same rival, a very big chance. We can change everything. Time now for a short break. Remember, if you can't be on the scene, you need to watch it on the screen. This is Sports Scene. We'll be back with more. Here's what's ahead. Finding football stars from victims of war, the story of Syrian refugees in Egypt. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. We come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference.
Well, welcome back. We return to Cairo where Egypt is hosting a tournament aimed at unearthing talent among victims of war. A Syrian football academy has organized a competition that supports children of refugees and gives them an opportunity to play in front of scouts and officials. Here is CGTN's Adel El Mahoui once more. Dubbed Syrian Stars, an Egypt-based football academy hold its first-of-kind international event to support victims of war. Children 12 and under came here to play football, hoping for a better future through a sports career. This is the first time we hold an event as big as this one. We want to see the new talent, which is very important to Syrian Football Academy in Egypt. Now, we are giving the opportunity for undiscovered talent from Egypt and other Arab countries to be seen. Then, we see how we can make those stars shine. Some children have faced exceptionally hard circumstances. They left their home to come live in Egypt. Syrians in Egypt are doing great work to make sure these kids have a normal life. Now the mission has grown to include other Arab nationals. There are talents that need guidance and need to be relocated to a club or city that can benefit from their football skills. Regional football officials and diplomats from the four participating countries came to show support. 84 children formed seven teams divided into two groups in this competition that has brought them hope. No matter how slim their chances are, they've put their best into chasing a dream to become football stars. Here, scouts can see me play. They can ask me to apply for trials in their clubs. I really wish that would happen. In Egypt, I would love to play for Al Ahli. I support the team and it's the best club in Africa. Many of the Syrians and Eritreans are refugees who've been living most of their lives in a different country. The Iraqi children are all orphans. War and terrorism deprive them from their parents' affection. They have flown all the way from home to join this inspiring event. One of the kids we foster was awarded the best rising talent in Iraq and is an orphan. We have great players, but unfortunately football officials do not focus on orphans. These kids are neglected, so this competition is the best we can offer to them. The kids play enthusiastically to score and win this humble tournament. Yet to all adults watching, this is more than a competition. For the few hours they'll be playing, football is offering hope for children who have not recovered from the atrocities of violence. Adam Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Well, that's it for this edition of Sports Scene. Remember, you can send us your feedback to the contacts on the screen and follow us on digital media platforms. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again same time next week. This was Sports Scene. Keep it right here on CGTN.